very much for your attendance here this afternoon for environmental planning and regulation. I have apologies from Councillor Finn and Councillor McLean. Moved Councillor Stoltz, seconded Councillor Thorihinger that those apologies be received. All those in favour, please say aye. Possibly carried. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest? Anton so. No. There are no. Um, we move then to item three, the confirmation of the non-confidential minutes, which appear on page six. Uh, is someone prepared to move that they are true and correct record of the last meeting? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Cranston. Seconded, Councillor Thorihinger. All those in favour that they be signed as such, please say aye. aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you. Are there any matters arising? I don't think so. Thank you. Any matters from the action sheet? We don't have it. Yes. Okay, so are we happy for the mover, Councillor Cranston and Councillor Thorihing are happy that it also covers the public excluded minutes which appear on pages 10 and 11 because there isn't any information there. So uh, the, is the rest of the meeting happy that they be included in that resolution? Everyone happy? Thank you. They're both minutes have been approved. From the action sheet, I had a substantial conversation this morning on one of our bylaws. Stock control appears. I don't think there's any matter there. No? So we move to the first item, which is the Natural Heritage Fund and the allocation of natural heritage money. Is one of the council officers going to speak to it? I'll move. I'll Thank you very much, well, Councillor Dunn. Move, yes. Councillor Dunn. Seconded, Councillor Stoltz. That um, that the paper, um, as presented, the recommendations there, naming seven applicants, some fully funded and some partially funded, be approved. I put that, any questions, Councillor? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I always like seeing this. There's some fantastic initiatives going on out there. Just with the uh, partial funding, so it's always we haven't actually seen the whole application. So just a reassurance, really, that when you do do the partial funding, it is still a satisfactory outcome from the whole application, you know, rather than a partial um, funding going there and they can't actually do what's intended. Thank you. Through Madam Chair. Um, on page 22 of 82, it does refer, we do to refer to a process that we have, and what you can see that um, each, each applicant has gone through a matrix in terms of um, the various different values that they're, score scores that they're assessed against, and the, the whole of the price of the funding application. So it's quite transparent in terms of who's actually applied and what percentage they've actually got for those. I think that clearly lays out the process it goes, but it, the detail actually is in there, in the paper. Um, but it would be a consideration, I'm assuming, so council officers are considering it? Yes. Because they do it. negotiate. They talk to the landowners once they get the proposal, don't they? Um, they do. Um, Mel, have you got anything to add? Or would you no, like to? Yes. Good. Could you Could come forward to, come, to, come, come come to the on. table where there's a speaker? Thank you. And I ask Mr. Zaman to introduce you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is Melanie Cheatham. She is one of our land management officers, and she is the one who actually deals with the landowners, the applications, assesses the grants as well, and has um, regular contact with them, and has actually written the paper. So I'm um, just going to hand over to Mel to give a little bit more detail of how that assessment occurs and uh, in ask, answer any other questions that the committee may have. The <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, yes, I, 
Um, so in regards to uh, how this decision was come about, um, <laughs> the um, decision was made to fully fund uh, the first and third rank projects, um, mainly because they, the first rank project obviously had um, very high uh, ecological significance um, with the regionally threatened species being the Kiwi. Um, and also the third uh, place project, um, similarly, well, it didn't have a nationally threatened species, but it was, um, it's, it's, it's a great project. And uh, at this stage, they're not asking for an awful lot of money, so. It was any new material. <coughs> Sorry? We can read that part of the document. Uh, yeah. Because Sorry. it's any new material. Um, and we did, because the question which may have been asked before you joined us was um, from Councillor Crenson, where they are partially funded, is, uh, is that partial funding going to enable the project to happen with some support from the land? Yes, yeah, so those, par those partially funded projects are um, all, apart from one, funded to more than 90% of what they've requested. Um, yeah. It was so that we could fund them all instead of leaving one out completely, but they are almost what they've asked for. Um, apart from the um, Mangkara Kapakaunga one, which is eligible for other sources of funding, uh, like one billion trees and trees that count. So, yeah, thanks for that. I wasn't concerned with the ones that were $8 short and things yeah. like that, which <laughs> I seem, seemed a bit unusual that you wouldn't fund it. 100% yeah, if it's, it's $8 it was, short, but, yeah, it's but it, it, was, it was around that one really being Mangafara on uh, Papakainga, um, because it was quite a shortfall there, so just to have the, the surety really that that's, if we do allocate 7500 to it, they'll still be using that money effectively and efficiently. Mm. Very good question, thank you. And one other comment I'd like to make, because I think it helps everyone understand how our protection of biodiversity and what we're actually achieving from it, is can, can we have, um, a, beside the graph, the size of the projects? Because while some of them are only a portion of the land, I know there's one there that's 20 hectares and the script tells me it's just going to plant steep slopes. But um, I think we, and one or two of them does tell us that what size the project is, but it would be interesting to know what we're achieving. Um, and so if just one further column could be added to the matrix when you put that information together, yep. so we understand. Yep. Thank you. So did we have a mover and a seconder? Usually I have that written down. Move, Councillor Dunn, seconded Councillor Stoll, wasn't it? Any further questions? I'll put that in. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary? Carried. Thank you. To page uh, 23 and the earthquake prone building status report. Um, would you like to join us, Mr. Petty? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do we have questions to Mr. Petty for this report? Any questions, anybody? Or well, I'll start while you're thinking. Can I just ask, um, on, on the R26, I mean, what process do we intend to follow um, with the building due to have received their notice in 218 and we've sent them from it? So can you tell us what the process is that we're going to be following up with respect to those buildings? So we gave them um, 10 days to respond. Um, we have res um, to respond to what they intend to do with the buildings. All 23 have responded. Of those um, 23 buildings, three have supplied um, engineers' reports that have proven that they're not earthquake prone. So we're down to 20. The others have all um, given various responses from um, we are due to start work um, later this year. We already have a building conceived for, you know, such as we can't get the contractor to um, we are waiting for the structural engineer to assess and then we'll decide what we'll do with the building. So the next step will be that I will um, write a report for the 1st of May meeting um, detailing every building as a separate item, what the response was, and then giving a recommendation for the um, committees consideration. Thank you. That's very helpful. The maps are very helpful too. Thank you. 
So the maps are not quite up to date. No. But, uh, <laughs> because things are changing. Because it's a chat moving feed. Yeah. And maybe some commentary around um, double brick buildings out, not now, but in the report for May outside of the city. And you've referred to churches, but there are one or two others that we know of that will have um, a status within council's records that you might include. So the um, brick buildings that are outside um, the area and you know, um, things like rural churches, so they are specifically in the Act as being able to um, apply for exemptions. Now that's something that was led by the Gisborne District Council. We started um, giving exemptions for rural churches back um, a few years ago, prompted by ex-councillor Busby in a church in Tokamaru Bay, and he had a valid point. So there's six tests and the buildings all have to pass the, the whole six to be able to be um, considered to be exempt from earthquake prone. So we have got one that will be, so I'm quite happy to talk about it. So the um, the old tote building at the race course, which is a disused building, um, it's a historic building, so it's not easily demolished. You'd have to go through his, um, Heritage New Zealand, but it meets all the six tests. It's hardly ever used. They did, you know, the only closest anyone ever gets to it is when they mow around it, and so it's there. So um, lead a brand own it, and they have already supplied a report from their chief executive that. Um, this is how we're going to use the building and it will pass the test for being exempt. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Councillor Cranston. So is there a kind of an assessment where, I know the parapet's for the bottom, but is there an assessment that this is a real risk to people inside the building, this is a real risk to people walking past the building? Because if it's a walking past the building type risk, then it's really got to be dealt with. But if it's only internal, you clear the people out. Uh, yes, so when I um, when I prepare my report for the 1st of May, there will be people um, applying for extensions. Depending on what the reason for the extensions, that'll be one of the weighting factors that will need to be considered of whether it poses a risk. We have buildings um, of the 20 that are left that some of them are down side streets or at the rear of other buildings that pose very little risk to um, anybody and some that front the main street which will need different consideration. Thank you. We'll look with interest. So, Council Dunn. Just following on from that, that question, do we, um, I understand that we are mostly approaching the building owners in terms of this earthquake status. How well do we tell the public about these buildings in terms of their safety should they be walking by? Do we have, do we have a responsibility to do that? Yes, the Act requires us to put notices on the front of the building, and then, um, so they have gone up, and then it's an informed decision about whether you enter or not. Um, Wellington City Council have been doing it even before the changes in 2017. Um, the reports I had from down there is it um, makes very little um, difference to the number of people who use the building, uh, but um, you know, we are required to put a notice in a prominent place, and it's an offence for the building owner to take that notice down. And I see at 24 in the paper that notice goes on a national register that is available for public inquiry. So if people are concerned or interested, there's clearly a national register of those buildings. Any further questions? No? Then thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Ketty. I'll put the recommendation that the paper be note the contents of the report. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you. So we move to paper... 1974, after our stock control on page 30. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Montgomery. We introduced Ms. Mon Ms Helen Montgomery to you at the last committee meeting. Welcome. Would you like to come and sit here where you have a speaker? Um, unfortunately, Councillor Burdett is not here today. He is taking a real interest in after our stock control. But we look forward to hearing what you've got to add. Thank you for the paper. Other questions to Ms Montgomery? I just wanted to ask, yes, I'm sure he would have phoned about the question. On 1B, um, this is a bit of a political hot potato, but where would the... If we're now going to be really careful about the financial overheads, where did they get allocated to previously? 
Um, so they were allocated to the um, animal control services generally, generally and um, obviously now we can be more specific and, and put that part of, of the section into the stock control area. Thank you. That's great. This is excellent progress. Move Councillor Stokes, seconded Councillor Cranston. Any further questions? I'll put it to the meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you very much. Mr. Montgomery. I think you're with us for the next report. The quarterly activity report. Councillors have had that report. Are there questions? Much better. Really great. Thank you, Councillor Stoltz. Do you wish to highlight any aspect or respond to any of the things that are clear from the graph, like operating expenditure and capital expenditure on page 37? If I read the map, it says they're off track. Um, th thank you, Madam Chair. So the report highlights um, all aspects of our different activities, and so um, it will in, on page 37, that specifically relates, relates to uh, building services. And you will see on, on page 38, it actually talks a little bit about the detail of the various activities. So um, total operating, um, you can add up all the, you've got the various different little flash light, um, traffic lights that tell you. So total operating um, income year to date is over by 48K. This is due to the increased request in terms of rooms and building consent. Um, we have reported back to committee that there's quite an increase in total number of consents, and you can see some of the detail. Um, it, do remember that this report is only till um, it's per quarter, so we're a bit behind, but we have, we're still noticing that there is still quite an increase in the amount of building consents we're actually getting. I believe last week through the door, we'd normally get about 20 in a week. We got 30 on one day. Um, so that that's starting to give an indication of, of the amount of work that's actually going on. We've seen this over other activity areas. Um, Can I just ask about the timing? Because I see it says that it's January 18, October 18 to January 19. Is that one October or 30th? Because the quarter would normally be one July to... Um, the August, September, and starting at one October. So, is that are we reading? So, it's um, in terms of the, the planning and reporting that we're using is the term plan from the first of October twenty eighteen to the thirty first of January twenty nineteen on page thirty four, and, and that's how we use our systems, and it's consistent. Mm. With consistent with our quarter of a financial year. Yes, and mm. consistent also with. A, the other committees that we have So it's the second to. quarter of the financial year that we're in. It's yes. just that on this page, it doesn't have whether we're talking about the front end of the month or the back. Yeah. And, and in terms of our operating expense, expenses year to date, in terms of the build, building section, um, the forecast is to be overspent by 113,000. <coughs> um, this is due to higher than expected consultancy fees, which we do recover by the consent uh, process. And, and there's a little bit of this parity between the actual charge out rate and how much we have in terms of consultants. But we do expect to get those back, but they won't necessarily show in this quarter. And legal expenses for civil litigation cases that we have that um, committee or council are aware of through um, other, other committees. Thank you. Um, in specific relation to those cases, we do get cost recovery. Um, Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thank you. Page 51, the target's not met on the noise complaints. Is that a resourcing issue? There's, I see 408 complaints received in the quarter, which does seem like a lot of people to get to. Um, the other one was the pollution incident, so it's like not meeting the target, but that's also I'm not sure there's a concern. Oh, there's 11, but there's 11 on there as well. So both those are unmet targets. 408 is quite a lot. Yeah. Um, through, through you, Manager, I'll, I'll, I'll 
start and, and Helen might chip in and give some more detail around that. So there is, um, in part, there is it due to some of the resourcing and having to prioritize against what we, other things that we've got on. In, in this particular quarter as well, there's a lot of um, staff required in terms of R&D and responding to a lot of those big events that actually happen over that time period. Um, there's also some new legislation that has actually come through as well. So it is, it is a bit of juggling in terms of that, those staff allocations and those noise complaints, as you can see, it's a quite a, um, I believe you quite, quite an increase, a significant increase. Um, yeah, 48 received in this quarter. Q1 was 286. That's more than double the noise complaints um, that we have. And I don't know if that's partly a seasonal. I haven't looked back at seasonal in terms of. Um, it suggests it is. Yes, it, 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 it does. And it does coincide with the time that some of these big events are actually on. Um, but not, it wouldn't not, be not council event. staff that respond to the noise complaint in the first instance. It's generally the security plan, isn't it? It, it is, um, if it's after hours. Um, but well, noises don't can, really, party noises don't happen no, in the daytime, no, no. generally. It's gener generally not, but there is just a, a, a huge increase in the amount of, of that. So we have fallen behind, behind on that, and it is a bit of a seasonal. It tends to be quieter, in the, in the, in the, in the, lesser you know, in the winter months. Since that can go on, Thank you. Yeah. So, um, through you, Madam Chair, it is a different category, I've been informed. Yeah. Can I just ask, while we're on that same page, what we're talking about at the very last, on the bottom of page 51 of 82, we're talking about LTP challenges and um, progress. And if we're still talking about noise control, and we were, but I don't, can't see how it relates, fundraising groups are exempt from the Act and therefore their activities have not been affected. What, we, what is that? What is that talking about? Fifty-one of eighty-two. They're not exempt from the noise control, though. Um, three, Madam Chair. No, they're not. Um, that was in is in relation to um, administration of bylaws and and things of that nature. So getting the right consents for those activities to operate. Um, you know, making sure they've got their firework permit or something of that nature. Thank you. We were to ask the community, they think we're very vigilant. Are there other questions for this paper? If not, I mean, we, we have a series of red dots, um, so we can expect the next quarter to maybe balance some of that out and maybe potentially not take them all away, but there'll be some change in that. Uh, not met targets. The recommendation appears on page 35. No further questions at all to that um, quarter. Moved Councillor Cranston, seconded Councillor Forehanger. I'll put that to the meeting then. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary carried, thank you very much. My goodness. At the back is my note um, from the last regional sector group meeting, which was in Wellington um, last in February. You'll see um, that some of the um, presentations are highlighted from the various um, key speakers to the meeting. And there was an interesting water update, which I've attached in full. And you'll see there the subgroup that is working with the Crown on water matters. And that aspect is really interesting. I'd like to move receipt of the report. Thank you, Councillor Cranston. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Probably not a question, but more um, an idea. 
Would be quite valuable to put this in front of the other committees as well. So you see that, for example, you can the attachment you have from Vaughan Payne, it refers to wastewater and I think there's a lot of information in there that'd be valuable to the wastewater management committee and also infrastructure. Right. Yeah, for I'm, I'm referring to the water and wastewater mm. aspects, and I think there's some really valuable information in there that could be shared. Our colleagues are meant to read all of our agendas, but I know but the subcommittees don't get them. So I hear what you're saying. I'll ask Mr. Zaman how that can happen. It might just be able to go as an information paper yes. to the wastewater management committee. Is that would you be happy with that? Yes. Can we do that? That's particularly I think really what you're suggesting is the paper of Vaughan Payne's paper rather than the whole thing. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Dunn. Yes. Okay. So maybe we send the whole thing, if that's being I mentioned it in there, or just the, just the attachment, which would you prefer? You're on that committee. Yes. I'll say the whole thing. Okay. We can just acknowledge that it's been before the council committee, but it's provided for information. No, no, we can do that. It can be attached in the file. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. No, thank you, Councillor Dunn. I'll put that to the paper. If there's no further questions, Councillor Corrihan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did want to know, like I noticed that you asked the question in the, um, in the main part of your paper around if the Council has made a submission to the um, local government funding point in the flow. Um, did you receive an answer in regards to that? Yes, I did. And we apparently did agree um, to, we didn't discuss it ourselves. And I found this really interesting because as soon as I heard about it while I was sitting at the meeting, I thought, we haven't had that discussion, and the um, uh, submissions closed that day, but when I inquired, Council did agree to support the LGNZ um, submission, and that was furnished, and I have received a copy of that. Thanks for picking it up, so I do have a copy of that. So if we're interested, um, we, we can ask for a copy of the LGNZ submission, and uh, um, there is to be further feedback once all those submissions have been pulled together by that committee. But it just seemed to um, stick out to me that last time there was a rating review, we put a whole lot of effort into it. I think Councillor Cranston might remember um, a huge amount of effort. It was some years ago, but a lot of effort was put into the, uh, the rate review by this council. And we actually ended up asking someone from one of the accounting firms to come and talk to us about the validity of some scenarios, some of which weren't valid um, under the Rating Act. But it was um, an interesting comparison of what we did this time and what we had done some years ago, which is why I asked about the paper. So if you'd like it to be, um, I can arrange for it just to be emailed to everybody if you're interested, or the link. Ms. Con can make available, we could make the link available for people so it doesn't block up their inbox. Thank you. Did you want to speak to us? Mm. Thanks. Mr. Zaman will have a comment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I think um, what, what what this paper does show that there's a, quite a lot of work going across all the central government and various things, the committees and subcommittees and central government committees, and there's a lot of information out there, um, which just brings nicely together what's been worked on. We often get asked to submit on things at very, very short notice um, in between committees as well. And uh, I was having a bit of think about this and what might be useful when we do get that is to whichever committee chair there is actually send that information through to see if there's something that a committee chair might actually want to look at or in terms oh. of staff looking at that because the, some new legislative, some of, it, some of it is directed directly at council and council officers for their input before a wider um, consultation period, but sometimes it is very, very short notice to start and to prepare that. So what, what I intend to do is to discuss this um, with the rest of the leadership team, mm -hmm. but also okay. look at just flagging up some of these which are quite important or at least a, a time frame for, for those. And, and some of this information does come through at different committees of what's coming through, but just in, in, if, if that's something you'd like and to And I think pursue. that's a good idea because that would apply to all of the committees of council relative to whatever the issue was that was coming before council for submission. So if it was something that related to one of the other committees that you would have a conversation with them about, or your senior management team would have about whether it's more some local input that's going to be put into 
Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, that's what I'm suggesting because mm. it has, the question has been asked, have we submitted on this or when did we mm. see that? But the timing of these are sometimes very rapid and there might be a process for actually addressing some of these submissions that we've asked to comment on or to inform committees whether there has been a wider government L um, LGNZ type response to some of these issues. But there is a lot in terms of program on the government's work agenda at the moment. Thank you. Just one other question, and um, maybe Ms. Easton might know. Has um, the report by Simon Upton on Overseer been released yet? Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, it has, and I've read it. So um, it's actually can't recall the recommendations off the top of my head, but it's kind of one of those quite ambivalent reports. It says Overseer's got you know, useful uses and that kind of thing. It's got its flaws and it's kind of a, it's a bit sitting on the fence actually. It's my mm. recollection, but yes, it's available. The, um, Simon Upton, did, he's the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment now. And he, that was interesting in itself that he explained that he sees the role, and this was for the benefit of all regional councils, he sees the role as investigating things that the government doesn't have MFV or someone else doing. Hence his choice of doing an overseer as an investigation. So he doesn't see the role of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment duplicating something else that's been investigated by elsewhere, but picking up on other things. And that he needed to report it to the government first and then release it. But even as he gave an overview, it was a bit like you described. Thank you. But it is a tool that we're potentially going to use. So, um, But if we're going to be using it long term, I think there's a fee involved, isn't there? So uh, three, Madam Chair, yes, for um, people to use it, and we do require our dairy farmers, all five of them, um, to do overseer for their effluent management. But uh, I guess that one of the issues with funding it is it's been part funded by regional councils mm -hmm. and um, in the fertiliser industry, and we do get requests frequently for would we like to chip in some money to fund its development, and I think that's the big issue with funding. It's, it, it does There is a fee to um, access it to use it, um, but um, there's a, also a wider issue about the fact that it's by no means uh, a perfect tool and needs ongoing investment. That's, that's, that's not really covered by those fees. Mm, I think it's an example, the effects base, but not really. And that is literally what he said to us. It is effects based, but not really. <laughs> Thank you. I move that paper be received, Councillor Cranston seconded it. All those in favour, two say aye. aye. Contrary, carry. Funny you should say that exactly. That's just what I was going to ask. If we could have one, yes, please. We we'll just have a verbal update on a matter. Can I? Um, we're just going to invite um, invite Dr. Cave to give us a verbal update on fanworm, which um, is, I think, particularly interesting, um, and we all and an interesting incursion. So look, we look forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. Thank you, Mr. Cave. Dr. Cave. Okay, well, um, this is just really an update. Um, we had a meeting in Napier yesterday with Customs New Zealand, Maritime New Zealand, and MPI Biodiversity, as well as ourselves. Um, and we also had some briefing notes from Eastern Port. Um, the current situation is that the yacht is detained by Maritime New Zealand. Um, the this is the vessel um, that we personal swept overboard um, two weeks ago, and um, the boat was then towed into port and found to be infested with fanworm plus a suite of other um, objectionable material. And um, so the action was taken to lift it out of the water as fast as we had authority to do so. And the fastest way was using Maritime New Zealand's power to detain. The vessel is unsafe to go to sea. Um, it doesn't have an operational motor. They um, uh, had no means of having an autopilot. Um, the vessel was using a small outboard from the dinghy um, lashed to the ladder at the back for any motive power. Um, there was enough food on board for one and a half weeks uh, for a six-week voyage. Um, and the general safety equipment on board was not up to scratch for even a coastal um, trip, let alone a, um, a trip through some rather difficult waters. 
Um, from a fan point of view, the quick action meant the risk to the port was reduced significantly. Um, we have identified a range of gaps in our, both our response, what customs did in Auckland in particular, um, and, um, and just how we now can actually work together with MPI in particular and Maritime New Zealand um, to respond very rapidly. We did have the issue that we had to use a crane to lift the vessel out of the water because the travel lift wasn't available. Um, and it would have been obviously preferable to have used the travel lift because it's cheaper. Um, there will be a discussion with the owner of the vessel who's in Brazil um, about um, what needs to be done before the vessel can leave. Um, the port has indicated that they do not want the vessel put back into the water um, because we have no proof of hull insurance. And so that if it goes back in the water and then sinks, um, the liability is with the, with the port. Can you tell us what happened to the fan room after that break of the bottom? Because I think we're really interested in that. What is the destruction process? Because we do not want to build it. <laughs> yeah, they, um, they do die um, within a certain period of time. Um, and there is some debate about it. Some material is being sent through to Niwa for final identification. There is, but it is, was scraped into um, containers and then sealed in plastic bags and then essentially went through the landfill system. So it's not disposed of anywhere else. The next step is that we have to water blast um, the, um, the hull and um, then also then lift the boat with the crane and then clean off any other areas where it's under, currently underneath um, the jack stays and things like that. Uh, um, the owner is being informed that those costs are recoverable under um, the Biosecurity Act. Um, and he has a lot of other costs he will have to deal with, um, such as the inoperable um, motor uh, before he can leave and that's how much of the cost falls to council, and not, and I don't want any more detail than what you've given us. But how much for to customs? Because customs have the government role to check on um, in, in what comes into New Zealand. So where do they? How do where do things get paid for between ourselves and customs? Customs, um, there are some gaps in the way the system works. I think we've identified that this was a vessel that had arrived in New Zealand over a year ago. Um, so it wasn't a short stay vessel um, and there were different rules relating to that. So customs basically just said, um, here you go off and you can now leave, but you're not allowed to land in any other New Zealand port. Mm -hmm. But the okay. cost... I appreciate that it's sensitive issues, so we won't ask any more questions, but we're very interested in fan worm. Yeah. I was lucky to see it. Yes, I'm fascinated. <laughs> and what I did was shine a photograph of the boat on the hull, on the hull and it was interesting. Councillor Cranston, sorry. The, uh, the, the vessel was in a uh, marina in Auckland, which is infested with fan room, um, but there are other species on board which would have come into the country um, when the vessel arrived from um, the Pacific um, in 2017. <laughs> a museum piece, right, thank you very much. Um, it says no, there's, I have had no requests for general business, um, so I believe that that is the end of the Environment Policy and Planning meeting today, so thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, thank you Council Officers, for your contribution.